Welcome to the 49th episode of The Logan Bartlett Show. Sounds weird saying that, uh, but nice to have the rebrand behind us. I appreciate everyone uh, reaching out with support over the course of the last week. It's been fun to commit for another, whatever, 40, 50 episodes to continuing to do this and bring more interesting people on. I uh, yeah, It was nice to have the article last week, even if it was a slightly uh, Bane rebrand that I went through and naming it after myself. So I uh, really appreciate everyone supporting and listening in and all that stuff. Uh, so what you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I had with Elad Gill. Elad is a angel investor in the Valley. He's uh, morphed into something of a solo capitalist. I think the term was actually originally coined around what he was doing, raising institutional capital, but operating as a uh, as a single VC himself without partners, without a junior team. And he's one of those people that seems to be ubiquitous. Uh, everyone seems to know him. He, uh, he wrote a book called The High Growth Handbook in which he spoke to a lot of different people about uh, lessons learned in operating companies. And so we talk about a bunch of different things, uh, the state of Silicon Valley right now as a area, uh, as well as um, what's actually going on in the ecosystem itself. We talk about venture funding and the amount of capital in the ecosystem. We talk about uh, what the last inter bu internet bubble was like and uh, some of his lessons from that, among a bunch of different things. So he is very thoughtful, uh, a really fun conversation, and uh, trust everyone will enjoy that now. But uh, as a reminder, please do like, subscribe, review, share the, uh, the podcast. Uh, we want to continue to drive subscriptions in particular to YouTube. And so if you're enjoying this, please do uh, that for us. And uh, we'll continue to bring you more content that you hopefully enjoy. So thanks everyone for listening in. Hope you enjoy the conversation with Elad Gill now. All right. Elad, thanks for doing this. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I, uh, so I, I guess maybe to start off for, I, I assume most people know know you, but how would you describe what it is you do? Oh, geez. Um, I do a mix of, or my career, I guess, has been a mix of starting, running, and investing in technology companies. And so over the time, over the years, I've functioned as an operator running large teams or functions at different companies, both startups as well as, you know, later stage things like Google or Twitter. Um, I've invested in a variety of different companies over time. I've helped incubate companies. So I just tend to be involved with a lot of different aspects of company formation and then operations. As a well-known person in Silicon Valley that's been a part of a bunch of influential businesses, right? Uh, you worked at Twitter, worked at Google, investor in Stripe, investor in Airbnb, and we, we can talk about a bunch of the different stuff like that. But so you first, I guess, a topical thing, just level setting on the background, you moved to Silicon Valley in the last downturn. Is that right? Yeah, basically, as um, the technology industry was collapsing after the dot-com bubble, I had perfect market timing and moved out here. Uh, honestly, probably similar to, I, I, I guess this will be an interesting, uh, what are the what are the similarities and differences, but not too dissimilar probably to this moment? Yeah, it wasn't too different. I think um, the downturn then is going to be dramatically worse than the downturn then will be. I think we're going to see some significant changes. Knock on wood on that. Yeah. Um, knock on wood, but um, obviously there's a lot more companies with better business models and better things in place. But yeah, when I moved out here, I joined a company. It was about 120 people. It grew to 160, and then it shrank to 15 people over five rounds of layoffs. And I got laid off in the third round. And I saw that behavior of you do a layoff, it's not deep enough and you keep cutting. And as an employee at a company like that, you kind of saw it coming. You know, you knew the revenue, you knew the burn, you knew how much cash was left. And, and so I remember actually um, going into a, a, a conference room with a friend of mine and like drawing out like our financials and saying, hey, we have to do layoffs again. You know, it was kind of obvious. So. Um, I've definitely lived through a similar period in the past. Was that uh, the experience of actually going through all of that? I assume now the advice is measure once or measure twice, three times, four times and cut once in, in that regard for founders. Yeah. In general, if you have to do a layoff, it's much better to do the deep one up front. And, um, you know, the very worst case and, uh, you know, it's unfortunate whenever you have to let people go. And again, I've been directly impacted myself, so I can really deeply empathize with it. But um, fundamentally, when you do a layoff, you want to do it deeper than you necessarily think. And if you need to hire back later, you can. In other words, you could find great people on the market six months later and grow the team again. But it's much better than doing that, than doing one hit after another after another and really taking that cultural impact. And I think a lot of founders worry about certain aspects of that. For example, there's one conversation I had recently where the founders were thinking of doing a 20, 25 percent layoff. And I was just raising the question of, well, uh, uh, what do you really, like six months from now, where do you hope to be? And they said, well, maybe more like 50% and maybe there's attrition. And, and I said, just do the 50%. And they were really worried about how the team would interpret that. They were worried about um, how hard of a thing that was to do. 
But the reality is culture gets really hurt when people have uncertainty and instability. And instability comes when you do it sequentially like that. Um, but also from an optics perspective, which was part of what they were worried about, um, either way you're doing a cut at the company, either way it's really unfortunate, either way people see their friends go. Um, and it's better to just deal with it all at once and just um, reset and stabilize and say, okay, we've done what we need to do and now we're going to you know, go and focus on building this company for everyone, including the shareholders who just left us. I, I want to talk more about tactics and the environment sure. and all that stuff, but uh, maybe on a, a more optimistic note, what, what appealed to you to moving out to Silicon Valley? What, what was the draw? Yeah, I know. I think um, so I was getting my, I, I got a PhD in biology at the time, uh, which I haven't used. And, um, you know, I thought technology was the best way to have a very large impact on the world. You know, I'd always worked on human diseases and, um, you know, neurodegeneration, cancer, things like that, gene, gene therapy. Um, and so similarly, when I went into technology, I really wanted to work on things that were very broadly impactful. You know, I view technology as fundamentally a force for positive societal change and, and global change and lifting people out of poverty and providing people with tools and things that they can use for their lives um, on a daily basis. And so um, I, I was just very techno-optimistic. And so I moved out here thinking that, you know, um, the Bay Area was the epicenter of technology. Technology was this force that was ripping through the world and doing all sorts of interesting things. And even though there was a downturn that was starting, it was kind of clear to me that that was a multi-decade journey. And therefore, you can show up in good times, you can show up in bad times, but either way, you have... 30, 40 years ahead of you of interesting things. And, and then you found your way to Google. Was that the next stop after? Yeah, I ended up at Google. Um, I worked at a couple startups and then um, I joined Google. And then at Google, I um, did two things. One is I helped start the mobile team. And then two is um, I worked on ads targeting, which were the at the time, you know, amongst the world's biggest machine learning and AI systems. And, and Google, I mean, people forget because it's such a big company today. But I mean, I remember when I was growing up, it was certain it was like nearly impossible to get a job at Google at the what was the actual interview process and the, uh, the yeah. culture in those early how big of a company was it? Uh, so the first time I interviewed and I got dinged, so I didn't get hired, unfortunately. Um, it was I think a few hundred people. And so um, I'd be retired right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, at that point, they just transitioned from saying we want to have really smart people on the product team because I was applying for a product manager role um, to people who have a very technical background. And I had a weird background. I have, I, have, I have a math degree. I have a PhD, but it's in biology, you know, but, and I didn't have the traditional CS route. Um, and so I didn't make it through the interviews. And the ironic thing was a lot of the people who were running the product org at the time were people with um, backgrounds more similar to mine than not. You know, you had Susan Wachiki, who had a, a liberal arts degree, I think, and a marketing background from Intel. She's very good. I, I used to work for her for a little bit. Um, you had Salar, who was a biology major, who was straight out of school and ended up running YouTube, amongst other things. Um, and so they actually, some of their best performers were people with these unusual backgrounds, but they kind of went and said, okay, we need to tighten the criteria. And so I didn't make it then. And then two or three years later, I got hired in um, when they were when they adapted the criteria again in terms of who they were willing to hire for certain roles. And, and so that, uh, so so it had what a thousand people. I probably done around fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred like people, and you were part of the growth through. Uh, yeah, when I left, it was about fifteen, sixteen thousand people, and that was three and a half years later. Wow. So they added thirteen and a half thousand people in three ish years, three and a half years. Wow. Uh, astronomical growth to to be a part of. I'm sure. What I mean, you've obviously written a book, uh, High Growth Handbook, and sort of talked through some of the growing aspects of it. But what what is maybe counterintuitive or, or not obvious about being a part of a company that's growing that quickly and just has the tiger by the tail or lightning in a bottle? In yeah, that I think it's three things. One is you don't actually realize how um, unique of a moment in time it is. You think every company is like that if it's your, if it's one of your first jobs, right? Or you think, oh, every success looks like this, and that obviously isn't true. Um, the second thing is there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty and you make the assumption that maybe the people at the top don't know what they're doing, but often they're being very smart about things and very thoughtful and it just doesn't translate all the way down in a very clear way. Right. And so a lot of people in circumstances like that tend to second guess the leadership of a company. And sometimes it's rightfully so, but often it's wrong, wrong, wrongly so. Uh, and then lastly, you just have to expect a chaotic environment. So when a company goes from, 1,500 to 15,000 or 100 to 1,000 or whatever sort of range of shift you want, um, it's a different company uh, probably every six to 12 months because the scale is different, the org structure is different, the number of people involved in decisions is different, the number of products you're building is different, and so you're effectively at a different company, right? And um, that tends to be underappreciated because the way that you function in a 100-person org is very different from a 1,000-person org. is very different from 10,000 people. And you have to modulate your own personal working style. And some people scale really well with that. And some people do very poorly. 
And the place where people tend to do very poorly is when they start worrying too much about themselves and their own careers in a way that's detrimental to the rest of the organization. And you see a lot of that kind of behavior as things really start working. And, and so the people that were able to survive and evolve through each of those uh, generations or through the, each of those evolutions, were w- was that the single trait that you would say most stood out behind high horsepower? And I'm sure, you know, wor- working hard and all that stuff, but um, like a willingness to think about just making progress and moving things forward and not worrying about themselves. Yeah, it's basically being able to put a lot of your own personal drivers and uncertainty aside and just focus on doing a good job for the business. And, um, you know, uh, the the second time I went through something like that was when I went to Twitter. I sold a company to Twitter when Twitter was about 90 people and then it grew to about 1,500 over two years and 2,500 the following year. And there was a big reorg that happened um, on the product org. And Dick, who was CEO at the time, asked different people, like, what do you want to do as your next role? And that caused a lot of lobbying for people. You know, different people said, "Oh, I want to, I want to run this part, or I want on that part." And everybody was um, lobbying for their job and kind of infighting. And I was one of the few people who said, "Well, I, you know, what do you need me to do? It's not about what I want to do. It's what does a company need me to do?" And so during that reorg, I think um, a significant chunk of the team got laid off or cut because they were acting badly. Mm-hmm. Um, I got promoted, and I think I was the only person in that cycle who got promoted. And I think it's because I said, "Hey, what do you need me to do? I don't care." Like. You know, it's not about me right now. We're going through a time of change. If you think about those two companies, Twitter and Google, uh, today, they're, both of them had lightning in the bottle and sort of the zeitgeist of Silicon Valley and found product market fit in a uh, extraordinary way, sure. right? Uh, today, those two businesses look very different mm-hmm. and their, their evolution and maturation and all that stuff has looked very different. Was that something... Did, did Twitter feel different uh, than Google, like when you were within the the orbit of the people around you or something about yeah. the product market? Like how much would you blame on product versus management versus all that stuff? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there was a period of time where uh, there's a lot of things that Twitter probably should have done that it didn't do. And that was product iteration and iteration speed. That was some of the types of people that got hired. And so I think fundamentally, it should be a dramatically bigger company. Certain acquisitions that it probably should have done that it, it may have had the opportunity to do at, cer- at certain times. And so um, it still ended up being a many tens of billions of dollar company, which is you know incredible. Sure. Um, and it's really impacted the globe and people in a very fundamental way, which is incredible. But you know, I, I think it's one of those companies that could have been five times bigger, 10 times bigger in terms of its impact. Um, so I do view it as both an amazing thing that was accomplished, but also a missed opportunity. Totally. Um, and so, uh, in between those two, you started a company. What was, did you always think of yourself as an entrepreneur and someone that was going to go down that path and it was just a matter of time and seasoning or what was the, uh, yeah, no, I always wanted to start a company. And, um, whenever I join a lab as a biologist, for example, I'd start a project. And so I think I just always had the, um, drive to want to do new things or try new things or look at new technologies or new aspects of things. And so, yeah, I always wanted to start a company and going into Google, um, part of my thought process was, let me go and do a good job here. But part of it was, um, let me start something here, which is why I got involved with the mobile team. So even there, I, you know, tried to start something up. Um, but then lastly, it was kind of like find the network and maybe find the, the problem statement or opportunity to work on afterwards. Because if you're at one of these companies that is at the epicenter of many different things, you both are in enormous talent density. That's where the, you know, there's certain companies where all the best people go to in certain moments of time. And then um, Silicon Valley really runs in little clicks or networks. And if you fall into one of those networks, um, you can basically work with those same people for the next 30 years in different formats, right? And you look at, for example, all the COOs across Silicon Valley for a period of time all came out of Google. It was like Cheryl at um, Facebook and Dennis Woodside at Dropbox and you, you know um, Lexi at Gusto and Claire Hughes Johnson at Stripe. And I mean, literally, most many of the main COOs all came out of one company. And you see that over and over and over again, where um, different generations of either founders, of investors, of operators all come from the same small subsets of networks. And then they help each other throughout their careers because they were kind of battle tested together. Um, And so joining Google was really formative from that perspective. And one of the pieces of career advice that I'd give people is, um, especially early in your career, don't worry about the role, don't worry about the compensation, just go to the right company. And that will solidify your career for the next decade. And that's way more important than getting, you know, a secondary role with high, a better role with better comp at a company that isn't going to matter as much. I have a theory that the center of Silicon Valley now is some combination of the Collisons, the Altmans, uh, yourself. Like there's some center orbit of, uh, of people in Silicon Valley that like have this tightly integrated network of, you know, investing together and in deals and all that stuff. So, um, no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's definitely generational cohorts. And I think... Um, 
I actually, just for my own sake, um, made like a, a slide recently for myself um, or like a spreadsheet, which is basically what did I, what do I think are the generational circles over the last few cycles and how are those shifting? And you could think of it by company. You could think of it by um, leaders that people look up to or founders people yep. look up to. Uh, you can view it by investors. You can view it by founder networks. And so every six, you know, five to seven years, the network flips. <laughs> and certain people remain relevant and other people flip over. And the question is, why do certain people have so much longevity? And it's very few people, if you actually think about it. Some platforms have longevity. Sure. But very few people are actually relevant over multiple cycles. And the question is, what's the common characteristic of those people? And it, was there any takeaway of what was the common characteristic? It's one of two things. They either have a platform company that continues to evolve in interesting ways, which in most companies in technology tend to stale out. Or it's people who reinvent themselves, right? It's sort of like Sam doing Looped and then running YC and then doing OpenAI and that, you know, and so he's reinvented himself over multiple cycles. Naval has done that, right? Um, early super angel, early into crypto, has done a bunch of AI stuff more recently. Like he's, he's constantly reinventing himself. And so I think the people who focus on that reinvention, and often I think those people are technology driven, right? They care about the tech and therefore they follow what all the interesting technologists are focused on. And that tends to be what drives waves. And that's very different from the person who's just interested in it because they want to make money or because of some other factor, right? And so it tends to be people, I think, who are technology-minded, and they tend to survive these multiple cycles because they follow the technology innovation and shifts in the smart, where the like really interesting builders working. <laughs> and as you think about where the interesting builders are working, I guess that's an interesting transition to uh, to investing and, and how you got into that and some of the areas that you spend time in. And so you were working at Twitter and were you doing angel investing on the side or? or yeah, how did I was that doing angel be? investing on the side. Um, and um, a lot of the investing that I did started because I, you know, I was a founder and as I was starting a company, I, um, me and a cohort of other people starting companies at the same time were all helping each other. And then a subset of them would ask me if I wanted to invest as part of their round. And so I just started investing. And so it was very um, uh, organic and almost accidental. This is 2012, 13? Um, yeah, I probably started investing around 2010. Okay. Uh, or 2009, I think, was probably my first investment. Yep. And then 2010 is when I really started doing it because Twitter bought my company. So I had a little bit of liquidity to do something with. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, so I just started helping friends. And then they just started asking me if I wanted to invest. And then... Um, you know, a lot of a lot of my best investments were almost accidental um, at that time. Hmm. And, and so, some of your best investments, and we can talk through a few of them. But uh, but you were early in Airbnb, mm -hmm. early in Pinterest, your investor in Stripe, among among many others. But uh, so, what was what was it that how did those deals come to be? I guess maybe in the case of sure. Airbnb or Pinterest or Stripe or whichever one. Um, and what did you sort of see in those early days? Yeah, I think um, you know, with Airbnb, I think I invested or they let me invest because I was helping them with their series A. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I'd helped with a list of like potential investors and I'd made a few introductions and kind of tried to help out a little bit in the background. Do you remember how you got to them originally or do you um, just I find met, service I met them at some event. Mm. Um, and so it was just, you know, a bunch of founders in the, yeah. in Silicon Valley kind of thing, hanging out and talking to each other and doing things. So I think I met them at an event. I can't remember which one. And then- um, Did people know it was a hot thing at that point? Like, did I mean, obviously not to the extent yeah. it is now, but uh, but was there some awareness that like, hey, this is has a real shot to yeah, be special? Yeah, there was there was um, good interest. You know, Sequoia just done their round, so that's always a good sign, yep. a good indicator. I've heard of them. Um, yeah, there's, um, I think uh, there was sort of a split view on it because I think some people thought, well, who's really going to open up their house to a stranger? And, you know, it was before you had a lot of um, online social cues around different people and aspects of um, security and things like that. And I know that a subset of the venture community said, oh, this is unfundable because what if an incident happens at somebody's house and there's a big PR storm and then it kills sure. the company, right? And so there, there was these sort of weird paranoid edge cases of what could happen. And so it was a little bit split at the time. I think maybe a round or two later, it was kind of a clearly like great company. Yep. Um, and I think when I, when I invested on my side, I think there were probably around eight people. They were still working out of one of the founder's houses and you'd walk in and because the company was growing so fast, there'd be like a person doing like a conference call in the bathroom and then a person doing a conference call in the stairwell. Like they were, they were like interviewing and then somebody would be in the kitchen, like with a small group meeting and, you know, just a little, this is like a little tiny, you know, I don't know if it's a one or two bedroom apartment in San Francisco and that's where the whole company was working out of. Right. And so. Um, it was a very special feel. Yeah, you know? and, and could you sense that there was this um, this lightning in a bottle from a 
user demand standpoint? Was it spent? I mean, I'm sure it was all the above, sure. but spending time with Ryan and the founding team, did, like what, what was it that sort of, you know, led to you really sure. leaning in? I mean, it was very exceptional founders, obviously for yeah. day one. Um, I think, um, and so they were very, very good, uh, and very smart. Um, but the other piece of it was, um, it, at least for me, it was a little bit easier because in the, I, I, I used to travel through a service called Servas, which nobody's heard of, but basically, um, after World War II, the uh, group in the Esperanto community um, decided that the best way to create world peace would be to allow people to stay with each other and do cultural exchanges. And so you could go up and sign up as a Servas traveler or a host, and they literally give you a little booklet with the phone numbers of people in a given city and their email addresses and things like that. And you could land in a city and randomly ping people and they'd let you stay at their house. <laughs> and so I traveled that way um, through a chunk of Europe, in part because I didn't have any money, right? And it was a cheap yeah, way yeah. to travel. But in part because you'd meet these random interesting people and they'd like show you around and you'd get to know them a little bit and you could spend like two, three nights with them. And it was all free. And I was like, oh, this is like monetizing something like that. I've done that, that makes a lot of sense. It's not scary. Um, and so uh, there was a little bit more natural intuition in terms of like, of course this would work. And if you looked at, if you've ever traveled in certain developing countries, you realize too, like this is a normal way to travel. You, you book a room in a small village somewhere that you randomly find and it's fine. And so, and you know, a person's house is their most precious asset. And if you can help them monetize that asset, that's a very powerful economic driver, right? So you could think of it from a sort of economics perspective. You could think of it in terms of just regular behavior that already exists in many places. Um, you know, Craigslist also had these sort of overnight rentals and houses and things like that. Um, or you could just view it from other experiences. And so it just, yeah, you know, it seemed to make sense. What, what about uh, Pinterest or Stripe or uh, another one that you Flexport, right, as well? Or what, what's another example of a uh, how you found uh, a company and a particularly yeah. interesting story from a sourcing standpoint in the early days? Uh, Stripe, if I remember correctly, um, happened uh, or I got involved with because I just uh, I heard about the service. It was something I would have used at my startup, and I thought it was really cool. I think they just launched, and they had like a handful of users. And so um, I just looked up the company, and I think I found Patrick's email address on like his personal website at the time. And I just emailed him and said, hey, this is really cool, and here are some of the other founders I work with as an investor. And like, um, I just sold the infrastructure company to Twitter, and do you want to meet up and just talk about infrastructure? I think what you're doing is really cool. And so the intention wasn't to invest. I just thought he was working on something really neat. And was it obvious that it was, I mean, obviously we're fortunate enough to be investors in, in Stripe, so I, I guess I could ask someone around the halls, but uh, because the, the idea itself sounds like other ideas, right? But but the the elegance of how they actually executed on with the documentation, at yeah. least as I understand it, was like the particular. So did you think the idea itself was was uh, novel or was there something about the approach or was it actually looking at the docs and all that stuff that got I you excited? I think the, the, the thing that um, got me was the product simplicity and the elegance as well as um, removing barriers for people to sign up. And so to me, the the big early innovation for them, and I'm, I'm not you know, a founder, I'm not, you know, you sure, should ask sure. them what the real innovation yeah. was. But one of the early things that I thought was a great hook was um, when you'd sign up for Braintree, which was the main competitor, mm -hmm. it took them about a week to verify the account because they were trying to um, check whether or not it was like a, a scam account. And so with Stripe, they would do instant um, uh, account verification slash activation. They would kind of verify it later. And so um, while you were waiting for Braintree to kick in, you'd sometimes go and try Stripe and you just start using it. And then you'd never switch to Braintree when you got the approval because you're already up and running. And so it was just removing friction in the wait time to start getting paid by your customers. Mm -hmm which is a big, powerful incentive. Yeah. And then later, Braintree adjusted, but by that point, Stripe already had critical mass, and Stripe was very engineering-driven, while Braintree was always very business-driven. And so they kept building really good product and technology, mm. um, and so they just outperformed or outcompeted in terms of the innovation around the product itself, You know, things that allowed marketplaces to do payouts or uh, you know, other things that were more complex than what Braintree offered at the time. I'm sure these uh, examples helped inform your investing strategy. But what, as you look at it today, like w what do you look for either in founders or companies or markets? Or how do you think about your investing strategy now? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the ways I differ from most early stage investors is that I um, care a lot about the product market early on. And a lot of people just talk about the founders. And obviously, founders are incredibly important. You know, I've started multiple companies myself, sure. so I, you know, yeah, yeah. I think it's an you important. Have to say that. Yeah, to, yeah. No, no, no. But I mean, like, yeah, I've started no, companies. Actually. Like, I obviously, I think it's important. But I've seen great people get absolutely crushed by terrible markets, and I've seen very mediocre teams do very well in great markets. Right? Yeah. I've seen like people who are just falling all over themselves build multi-billion-dollar companies, 
And so um, both sides are kind of disheartening in a weird way. I mean, uh, the, the side yeah. that there's great founders just banging their head against the wall, not making progress and the side that there's people that are you know, yeah. just falling into money pits. Yeah. yeah. And Andy Ratcliffe has a saying about all this, but I think that the, the mainline takeaway is if you have both, you know, great, t- great market or great product market and great founders and something magical happens. And that's when you end up with a Stripe or a Google or one of these truly outsized companies that actually realize their full potential. You know, and so I think that's the difference is I think product market fit gets you from zero to one, but the thing that gets you from one to a thousand or whatever number you want to use is really, um, that amazing team then executing on the opportunity. Inevitably, you're going to have to do more things than just what got you from zero to one necessarily. Right. As I guess the Google example speaks, how how do you think about the, what makes a good product market? Because I assume a lot of the times you're investing, like you can sort of look at the product and you can sort of look at the market, but you don't have, I, I'm fortunate enough to be a growth investor that I can validate the feedback loop of, hey, is the dog, you do the dog food and talk to the customers and sort of think about the extrapolation of the lines and think mm-hmm. about competitors and all that sure. stuff. How do you think about it when it's, when they're maybe a little more divorced, there isn't yeah. exactly a product fully formed and the market, you know, is TBD? Yeah, it kind of depends on what it is. You know, like sometimes you see these technology shifts and you know that there's going to be some interesting companies there, but you don't necessarily know which one. So Andero would be a good example of that in defense tech, right? You knew that there was a rise of drones. You knew there was a rise of machine vision and AI. And you knew that that would create opportunities in terms of sensor networks, in terms of drones, in terms of surveillance, in terms of a variety of things. Um, And so clearly there was going to be a really interesting next-gen defense tech company. But the question is, which one would it be? And what are the other characteristics that are needed in order for that to substantiate, right? So there's some markets where it's kind of clear that the market is ready to shift. And the question is, who will do it? I think the harder case is when the market side is less certain, Mm -hmm. right? And so then to your point, maybe in a SaaS company, you talk to customers or, you know, maybe you see a company reinventing something that's owned by private equity and therefore isn't being run well and they're doing, you know, a 20 year refresh on an older type of product, you know, with modern software approaches. Yep. So it kind of really depends on the market segment. Uh, and it kind of depends on what's really um, happening. In terms of the the founders themselves, are are there characteristics? I mean, the Collisons are obviously brilliant. Palmer Lucky is a very unique, special individual. Um, are there characteristics from a founder standpoint that you found are kind of consistent that that you look for or that you found to be the most successful? Yeah, I think there's a couple. I think um, you know, there's the obvious things around. Can you learn very rapidly? Um, and so often I feel like the best founders query a few different people and they come up with their own point of view. And sometimes it agrees with yours, sometimes it doesn't, but they, they make the decision, but they're also very thoughtful about how they come up to that conclusion. Um, I think decisiveness tends to help. Um, I think something that got underappreciated for a while was just competitive drive or drive to do something big maybe is a better way to put it. Cause in some cases you're just competing with yourself. You're not competing with others, right? Um, or you're competing with some conception of what you should accomplish. Um, but I think that's very, that got underrated for a long time. Um, as we started talking about, well, everything needs to be balanced in terms of work life and all these other things. And I think in reality, many of the best founders I know are, um, they just want to do something really big and they're willing to really push themselves to do it and work very hard to do it. And the extremes of that could almost be, um, you know, every once, every generation you see a founder who I almost think is like self-sacrificing themselves to create something, right? I feel like if you go back through the history of entrepreneurs doing massive outsized things, they tend to have that common trait of almost like self-sacrifice for society, which may or may not be appreciated Yeah, in order to pull off something big. It's interesting on the first one, I, I found the the learning loops and the feedback loop uh, to be particularly um, helpful, right? When, when someone's, uh, you f- see them making incremental progress from a thought pro- and everything uh, comes much better prepared and they, they don't make the same mistake twice and, and all of that. Is there any way from a competitive, and that, that's kind of easier to test in some ways where you have one conversation, uh-huh. you come back, you ask a similar, sure. slightly different question. From a competitive drive standpoint, obviously there's the huge outlier examples yeah. of, of this, like the Elon Musk's or whatever it is. Um, do, do you try to dig into like what motivates the person at a, at a personal level uh, and like what why they started the company? or what? I think it's more like I look for characteristics where I, sh- I see them pushing themselves in different ways that aren't necessary to do something interesting or important or whatever. And so it's less about, you know, tell me about your mother. And it's more yeah. about what have you done in your life that other people haven't pulled off? And how did you pull it off, even if it's small things? Or where did you take a stance that was opposed to everybody else and just did what you thought was right? You know, things like that. Um, I mean, there's other characteristics, too, that we haven't touched upon. You know, I think every um, founding team, like if you look at Apple as an analogy, right, you had Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and then eventually Tim Cook. Um, 
Wozniak could build anything, Jobs could sell anything, and Cook could run the ships, right? And eventually over the life of a company, you need those things. In an early stage company, you need the first two. You need somebody who can build something, and then you need somebody who can sell. And by sell, I mean um, they can convince employees to join. They can raise money from people. They can convince people to give them money. You know, they can convince customers to use them. And so I think, uh, you know, often when I look at the context of a founding team I'm looking at, is there somebody here who can sell in one form or another? Um, and then is there somebody who can build? And maybe it's the same person, maybe it's not. I've heard you push back on some of the myths of Silicon Valley. And, and one of the ones that I think is somewhat considered, well, the, the equal ownership and uh, co-CEO or some of mm-hmm. those things, but particularly equal ownership around co-founders. And uh, I feel like it's a little mm-hmm. bit of a of a myth uh, or it's something that, that actually isn't the case in most instances? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I would kind of separate um, equity ownership from control. I actually care more about control than equity. Mm. Um, I do think that if you look at the biggest outsides of successes, almost all of them were unequal in both. Mm. You know, that was Apple and um, that was Microsoft and that was Amazon. And then, you know, it was either sole founder Even or- Even Google, right? There was a little bit of- It was a tiny bit, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'm guessing that maybe had to do with control, right? Yeah. Like Larry owned a little bit more than Sergey. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the most equal. And then I think um, YC really pushed this this viewpoint of, you know, things have to be equal. You, you want your co-founders to be equal because you're in it together. But if you actually look at the data of the biggest successes, um, many of them were unequal. And that includes actually some of the, the, the best outcomes for YC so far. You know, you look at the Dropbox cap table is a little bit unequal. You look at a few of the other ones, you know, it's unequal. And there's obvious counterexamples to that yeah, too. Sure. Um, but in general, I think the more important point is less about is the equity equal and more is control equal. And you need somebody in charge and you need somebody able to make decisions in most cases. And there's some counterexamples to that. Like I think Robin Hood always had co-CEOs and there's, there's a few, there's a handful of, of counters, but on average, um, the two main reasons companies fail is they have co-founder conflicts and they can't move forward and they blow up or they run out of money, which is, which means you don't have product market fit, yep. right? Or you can't sell. Um, and the main reason I've seen co-founder conflicts happen is a lack of agreement on who makes decisions under certain circumstances. And often you'll meet a founding team and one founder, and the founders will always say, oh, I've known this person for like four years, we were roommates, we're good friends, we've worked together, it's no problem, we're not gonna fight. And you'll say, well, what happens if you do fight? What if you disagree? And it's not even a fight, what if you disagree? And they say, well, I'm the technical person, so I make technical decisions, and I'm the business person, and I I make business decisions, so we're not gonna disagree. And you're like, well, what if it impacts the whole company? Mm -hmm. Then who decides, right? And so um, often that lack of clarity around, there's one person who's in charge, you may not agree, but you need to um, decide that you're going to commit to what they're doing and just follow through. Um, that's where a lot of companies end up blowing up. And so um, I care more about that than equity division. But equity division is sometimes a sign of that. In other words, if the if the equity is clearly unequal, it usually means the control is also unequal, and therefore they've already talked about it. So I guess you've had this interesting, we're talking about decision-making processes, but you've had this interesting journey from being a, a small angel using mm-hmm. your uh, your your own money that you mm-hmm. made from the Twitter sale or sale to Twitter to now you're leading rounds mm-hmm. and uh, big multi-billion dollar mm-hmm. valuations and all that stuff. Um, what has your evolution as an investor, like how mm-hmm. has that changed? Is your decision-making process similar? I'm sure the uh-huh. inputs are much more informed, but your decision-making process, what's that like today? Versus is what it was oh like. yeah. yeah, I mean, most of my investing, or much of my investing, is still like angel checks, and then yep. I can pull on either funds or SPVs uh, to do larger investments. But um, y- you know, I-, I think the decision making criteria for early stage investment is very different from late stage because you just don't have much information early, and so you really have to think through what are the indicators that you think this is a good product or good product market and good founders. But um, you know, for a late stage company, you have lots of data, and you know. Um, there you can actually start to ask things around, you know, what are the underlying principles of this business model as seen through the data? Hmm. And what is the effective TAM and what is a competitive dynamic and what is LTV CAC and what, you know, what are all the metrics, right? The NRR and all the SaaS metrics. And and so I think you have um, information that you can then extrapolate off of. And it feels to me like maybe the the art there is trying to figure out how far can you actually extrapolate yeah, yeah, yeah. and how quickly do things degrade or not? Um, and then how defensible is this thing over time? Yep. Um, and so I think it's a it's a overlapping mindset if you take a market driven approach, but I think where early stage investors fail to transition into later stage investors is when they um, don't look at all those metrics and just say, oh, the it seems like there's momentum and the the people are really smart, so I'll keep going. Yep. And the place where late stage investors seem to fail when they go to early stages, uh, they don't try to imagine enough of the future, and they base that on really early core metrics that are likely to change. Margins are going to expand and. 
you know, your LTV CAC will shift, like all these things will shift and they often shift in reasonably repeatable ways. Yep. And so they don't really extrapolate that likely shift. And so they say, oh, this is a bad business or this isn't that interesting or it's too small. In terms of the actual like coming to the the yes decision that you're going to do something, is it is it uh, and going through because there is a lot of data and information when you're leading a round and trip actions or whatever it is uh, versus uh, a early stage seed check when it's a PowerPoint. Um, are there are there people that you'll say? Obviously, you'll do diligence and all that stuff. But are are there core people that you consistently check with on investments, or is it just your your own process that you kind of run uh, autonomously and then make the decision at the end of the day? How does that? Yeah, work? I mean, I make my own decisions. I think ultimately, um, there's a set of people I think are very smart about different topic areas, and so you know, I'll call them and talk to them about different things. So often. You know, maybe there's a founder who's built something in an adjacent area who has some really good insights. And so I'll always get the company's clearance to discuss things with somebody so yep. that they don't feel that I'm going out of the loop or something. But sometimes I'll want a second opinion. Often I'll talk to customers, you know, do the full sort of round of diligence, um, you know, uh, tweak the model, all that kind of stuff to try and understand is this really, um, does this actually make sense or not? Yeah. Do you, have you had, uh, mentors along the way or people that have been uh, particularly, I mean, I'm sure that have mm -hmm. been particularly helpful, but people you've really looked up to? I think there's people who've definitely been helpful. There's definitely people that I admire in terms of what they've done. I don't know that I've ever had like a traditional mentor-mentee relationship where there's somebody I always go to and they help me. I think it's been more distributed or maybe it's been more peer-driven. You know, when I was starting a company, most of the people who really helped me were some of my angel investors who were great. You know, I had people like Reid Hoffman and Naval and others like early on um, good investing group. in my companies. Um, but a lot of it was just my peers, you know, it's other people starting companies at the same time and asking them for advice and then asking people, you know, a year or two ahead. And that was often the best advice that I would get in peril to some of these really smart, outstanding people on the investor side. And so, um, I kind of feel like peer networks are under discussed or underrated as sources of, um, I don't know what to call it, cross mentorship or yep. something. And, um, I don't feel like I've ever had like a very traditional mentor mentee thing where, you know, there's a person I check in with every month or quarter or whatever who gives me that sage advice on that, uh, you know, yeah, broadly. Yeah. So it cuts against the uh, traditional, I guess, uh, ventures and apprenticeship business or whatever the, the thing mm -hmm. that I always mm -hmm. heard growing up. But it's clearly yeah, that's probably true. And, you know, in the context of a firm, that's probably very true. Um, in the context of just the broader ecosystem of stuff, you'd go, at least I would go and I'd talk to different people and I'd see what does this person do versus that person and what are the insights. You know, um, and there's there's vastly differing styles of investing. Yep. Right. Like Peter Thiel invests very different from Mike Morris, invests very different from Naval, who invests very different from some other, you know, great angel sure. or investor. Yeah. Or, um, and so, uh, and certain styles work great for certain people, but they don't necessarily extrapolate to everyone. And so, you almost have to ask, like, what's your own approach or style, and how does that fit relative to the types of companies that you get involved with, the types of founders that you can actually be helpful to. Um, and so I think like each style stands on its own merits and different people can be very successful at them. We talked about product market fit and also the differences between early stage investing and growth investing in your mind. How do you think about, uh, what I, I use the term product market fit post product market fit investing as what, what I'll do. How do you sort of think about defining what that is and what you're actually looking for that the dogs will eat the dog food or that that validation is there at at whatever stage it is that you're getting involved in yeah it really depends on the type of company like um again you have a, a set of course ass metrics that look very different from like a consumer app and yeah. the things that you look there part of it is data and then part of it is just uh customer user testimonials you know you can if some of it just really comes out in terms of the enthusiasm that small initial cohort has for the product um, there's other signs too, like if a product is broken all the time, but everybody keeps using it, there's clearly product market fit. Yeah. I'm sure you love um, that on Twitter in yeah, some Twitter ways. was a yeah. good example, but you see that with some SaaS products too, or with other things, yeah. you know, the fact that chat GPT is down all the time right now is a great sign of product market fit, right? Yeah. Um, it's because too many people are using it. That's a great problem to have. Um, one thing I've noticed is that people who, um, have worked on things without product market fit that they thought had product market fit when they finally go and work on something that truly is working, they realize the immense difference and the degree to which they were fooling themselves. Yep. You feel it qual uh, very um, qualitatively. You feel the market pulling things from you and your customers are constantly complaining about stuff, but they're still buying your product. Yes. It's very different from you're going and you're chasing everybody and every sale is gruesome and everything is a grind and versus, hey, people keep calling me. Um, and so it's this transition and until it happens, you don't realize what that really feels like. And so I think there's a lot of these sort of fake forms of product market fit that people think they have. And then once they truly get it, they're like, oh my gosh, like this is 
uh, you know, very different. It's a very different world. When and maybe you experienced this with with uh, founding of Color or Mixer or uh, just just being an advisor to a bunch of companies. But as you search for this uh, ethereal uh, product market fit, do do you have advice or uh, as people kind of get lost in the journey a little bit and try to keep slogging ahead to find that lightning in a bottle moment? Are there tactics or, or advice that you give to founders to try to different different things that they can do? You know, I think fundamentally, um, one of the other things that people tend to get wrong is, um, or I should say lore in Silicon Valley isn't quite correct on, is there's this lore that you should grind eternally and then eventually something will work. And the reality is most of the companies, not all, but the vast majority of companies I've been involved with that worked ended up working pretty early. And once they started working, they just kept working. And then every once in a while, every company will have that crisis two, three years in, or they need to shift the business model or the, the customer base or whatever. But for a period of time, it's going to work, and it tends to work pretty fast. And so um, I think that's where uh, people um, end up spending years and years and years of life just grinding away on something that isn't going to work, because maybe it'll work if I do these three more tweaks, and maybe it'll work if this month it'll finally you know, I keep going. And for a very small number of cases, that happens, but for the vast majority, it works immediately or near immediately, right? And so if you're three, four years in and you're still kind of grinding on every single thing, it's not working, yeah. right? And you, maybe you can tell in two years, it depends on the type of company, right? Yeah. Consumer product, you can tell very fast, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think that's one of the things that people kind of mislead themselves and people that they work with about. Um, and uh, I think the other piece of it is um, when times are uh, tough, some of the best advice you can give somebody is just keep going no matter what. You know, for example, now if we go into a recession, a lot of customers may stop buying, things may slow down. That's going to be normal and you have to just power through that. When times are good, the worst advice you can give somebody is keep going no matter what. Because there's enormous opportunity cost on your time and most things don't work. And most of the time, you should actually figure out when do you give up um, and when should you actually quit? And it's really hard to know because you always think next quarter, we just do two more things, right? Yeah. But over the last four or five years, there's too much advice going in the opposite direction of keep going no matter what, it's no big deal. And there was always more capital to fund you. And so I think people ended up wasting years of their lives because of that, because of the bad advice given to keep going no matter what, just keep grinding, you'll find it someday. And it's interesting, most people that end up, I've heard you talk about this as well, but when you pivot or try to iterate, most people iterate around the problem set that's in front of them, right? It, it's it's hard if you're starting a uh, whatever a ed tech company to then pivot into defense tech or whatever it is because this is the world that you know. But the answer might be that you're in a bad market, right? That there isn't anything that exists over here, and you need to go find somewhere somewhere else to go. Right? Yeah, totally. And if you pivot to your point, you may want to pivot across markets, but then you have to ask yourself, well, should I just reset my company? Should I yes. restart it? Should I shut it down? Should I get different investors who understand that market segment? Should I hire different people who want to work in it? And so a lot of people, when they pivot too, they bring the whole ship with them. And sometimes that works out fine, but often it actually is a detriment and a bit of a drag. And so you kind of have to figure out when do you um, make those transitions or jumps and when do you just kind of say, okay, I'm going to restart everything and I'm going to start a little bit fresh. So in talking about uh, working with founders and being an advisor and angel investor and all that, what... What is your style in working with founders today? Oh, geez. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what that. Um, yeah. I mean, your communication style, how often you speak to them, like uh, you're not, do you take board seats, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tend to try to avoid board seats. I think, um, you know, I can still meet with um, people regularly and help them. And, yep. you know, I feel like. Uh, soft diplomacy. Uh, soft diplomacy. You know, I think it, it's both a different type of relationship, but also, you um, I think board seats take up an enormous amount of time and they aren't always that productive for all parties involved. I'm familiar. And so, yeah. And so um, I tend to avoid them. Um, there's still some boards I'm involved with and, um, you know, every once in a while, there's always a chance I'll take on another board seat. But in general, I try to avoid them. Um, yeah. You know, I think fundamentally, if I, if I were to graph startup help needed over time and, you know, one axis is amount of help and the other axis is stage of company. Um, early on, it's very spiky, right? It's kind of, hey, we're firing somebody for the first time, we don't know what to do, or we're raising around, can you help us with that? Interrupt driven um, and episodic. And, yeah, and episodic. Yeah. And you may have a sudden burst of activity where for a week you talk to the same person three times a day, and then you don't hear from somebody from, for two months. And that's like a normal seed stage relationship. And in, in fact, the people that I know who say that, hey, I, you know, I call the founders I'm involved with every day, I'm like, wow, you're, are you nagging them? Like, yes. what, like what are you doing? You know? like, why yes. are you bothering yeah, these people? Yeah, yeah. Um, they should be, they, you know, their heads down and building, and that's important. Um, 
And then as the company starts working and you hit product market fit, there's often a period where you have um, great product market fit, but no, but not very strong internal leadership or executives. And so you're, you're ramping up the company and at the same time, the amount of help that's needed externally goes up dramatically because everything's breaking and the company's doing all sorts of new things. You're hiring a CFO and GC and all these roles for the first time you've never hired. Maybe you're doing M&A and buying companies for the first time. You're expanding product lines, you're internationalizing. There's all this stuff and all this chaos and the company's growing and you don't have anybody inside who's managed those things before and everything starts breaking. And that's when I help a lot because that's when the most help is needed externally. And then once you hire in your executive team and they're really strong and performant, things settle back down and then mm. it's spiky again. Yeah. Right? And so I kind of view it as that journey. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I guess I hadn't exactly thought of it that way, but but in the beginning, every problem is, there, there's often problems that are gonna be very unique and bespoke to the individual market and you need to build, right? And so all that's going on. And then you get to the point in time that there's a bunch of repeat problems that have been solved before in some way, right? How, who's What type of VP of engineering to hire? What type of CRO? What, you sure. know, doing M&A? What's our that. framework for internationalization? And there's like five frameworks that people use and they're usually the same thing. And it's yes. like- These are solved problems that we don't need to reinvent the wheel on. And then, yeah. And then the problems sort of go back to being totally unique, right? Totally yeah. unique or just kind of episodic. Yeah. You know, oh, there's a crypto winner. Like, what should we do now given that for the next two, three years, there's going to be hibernation in the industry. Yep. And if you're a late stage company, the answer is, well, go buy a bunch of stuff, right? Yes. This is a great time to buy the best companies in your market segment, you know? Yeah. And so um, I do think that there are these kind of moments in time where you can like help and intervene for a later stage company outside of this crazy breakout growth period. But I do think it settles down. Right? Yeah. A lot of startups, and this is something particularly... Uh, technical founders will often want to reinvent certain aspects. Sales is the big one, right? Mm-hmm. I've, heard, I've heard you talk about this, but what are, what are some of the processes or, or ways that you, um, uh, things that you see get, get uh, wanted to be redone over and over again, but maybe don't move the needle for a startup success? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. Sales is the biggest one where you're actually often moving the needle in the negative direction. Yes. You're basically losing a year or two because you want to reinvent some stuff that... I lost like a week reading books on human motivation and internal like mm-hmm. drive and all this stuff to convince a uh, founder that they needed mm-hmm. to compensate salespeople with uh, with quotas and all that. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a bunch of stuff that keeps getting reinvented. And that's because a lot of people are very smart and very innovative. And so they want to innovate in other areas that they think are important to their business. So I understand the instinct. Yep. But the reality as well is just like there's engineering best practices and, you know, um, different things that have been developed over decades in terms of, you know, everything from scrums to code reviews to you name it. Similarly for sales, there's these set of processes that have been process engineered for decades and they tend to work. And so it's more just um, understanding that it isn't just arbitrary business people making things up. Um, although sometimes it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that's one area. I think... Um, you know, one thing that happened to me in my career is when I joined Google, um, Larry had removed all the middle managers from the company. And so effectively, we ended up in a situation where every director of engineering had 50 to 100 reports, which meant that nobody could actually meet with their manager, right? Because how, how are you going to meet with 100 people even in the course of a year yeah. to do one-on-ones and things like that? And so you had this gray market for talent. And so a side effect of that was it actually allowed me to help start the mobile team there is because I could actually pull people onto my team to work on mobile and their managers didn't know that they were missing from whatever area they were actually supposed to be in because nobody actually knew where people were. It was another month before they had to check back in. Yeah, and so it was like a gray market for talent that enabled all sorts of really interesting projects to start at Google during that time. So an unexpected side effect of that lack of management was you could do interesting new projects. The downside of it, of course, was you didn't have coordination and people got lost and certain types of people just didn't do any work. And, you know, it was just kind of a mess. It's a good way of testing product market fit is eliminating all middle managers and seeing what happens and if it keeps going. Yeah, but for me, it was great because I could like recruit people on and we could go build stuff. How long was that period of time? Mm, I think it was maybe, uh, actually, I don't remember. It was like, it, it was at least a couple quarters where it kind of felt like that. And then they realized it wasn't working and it got consolidated back. But um, for a period of time, there was this gray market, you know? It's an interesting, I mean, it always feels like overhead and bloat, right? Mm-hmm. It's one of the, it, the management feels like it's introducing process and all that. But mm-hmm. you're, to your point, like if you can't have 100 direct reports, right? You can't get anything done or coordinated or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Are, are there other, we talked a little bit about like myths or things that are kind of in the ethos of, of Silicon Valley that are standardized in some ways or get shared uh as canonical um yeah. are there other things that you think maybe aren't true uh or that yeah, that's a good question i mean the ones that come to mind immediately are some of the ones that we discussed it's like you want unequal co-founders at least in terms of yep. control maybe in equity maybe not um don't grind forever there's probably some point where you should give up yeah um uh, as awful as it is to say that um 
you know, that's probably a second one. Uh, market often matters more than founders. Yep. You know, that's kind of a tough point as a founder to actually, you know, I've started multiple companies. It's painful for me to think about that, but it's true. Um, so I feel like there's a couple things like that. What about in terms of uh, Silicon Valley today, right? There's, I, I, you lived it, and so you could speak to it better than I, but there's, it does sort of feel like there's this negative uh attitude, both to Silicon Valley, the ethos, as well as mm. California, the, mm-hmm. the Bay Area sure. as well. What's your, was that similar to what it was after the bubble burst in the internet bubble that? Yeah, I don't know as an honest answer because I was just struggling to like find a job and yeah. make rent and, you know. Like I, a fish in water. You're like, yeah, I didn't yeah. have like some deep view of the philosophical underpinnings. I was like, I need to get a job, you know, yes. and like there's no jobs. So what do I do? Um, uh, I actually ended up just volunteering at companies because I couldn't find a real job. And so I just build experience that way. You're not paying um, attention to the media sentiment and narrative yeah, was, at that point. You're <laughs> trying, to, like, trying yeah. to eat food. and yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think um, I think it's been unfortunate to watch um, the degree to which cynicism has crept in. And I think it's crept in for two reasons. I think one is um, a bunch of people showed up because of the money, right? Because that always happens whenever you have an upcycle in any industry. And then second, politics really pervaded wor- the workplace and the politics often took a very cynical slant on everything because fundamentally people who are politically oriented and by political oriented, I mean, literally like politics in terms yeah, of like sure. Democrat versus Republican and policies and all this stuff, um, tend to be more cynical in their slant on things. Right. Um, in terms of just how politics functions. And so I think that really, uh, changed some of the culture in Silicon Valley for a bit of time mm. where decisions were motivated by, um, factors that maybe had nothing to do with the actual company. Also the scale of the businesses as well. I mm-hmm. guess like yeah. as we think about what uh and and the power that that they wield it feels like I think about the way that uh Hollywood got covered in the 50s or government got covered in the 80s and yeah. sports in the it sort sure. of feels like we've we've entered politics are now kind of being covered as as sport mm-hmm. almost like and people are paying attention to it in the way yeah. that uh that technology never has. Yeah, scale really matters, I think, in part just because of the types of people who get attracted into into things that are safe, right? And so you end up with, um, you know, effectively bureaucrats, right? A lot of the middle managers, I think, at the biggest tech companies are probably more and more in the the line of people who would have been, to your point, working in big government, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago or who would have been in banking and would have been middle managers at a bank. You know, it's kind of the same risk-averse status-seeking profile versus impact-seeking profiles. And the confounder on it is some of these tech companies are so large and have such full employment because they're such great business models. The business models are almost too good. And so you can hire huge amounts of people who don't really necessarily do that much. Um, And you're effectively providing universal basic income, right? You're basically having UBI for people who went to good schools. Um, And that really changes the dynamic of how you think about your work and entitlement around the work and what needs to get done on a certain day and all that kind of stuff. And so I think there's been a big shift in terms of risk aversion but also the reward system is almost like you're getting paid no matter what you do, right? Or no matter what you accomplish. And so you look at, I'll give you an example. Uh, Meta went from 44,000 to 88,000 people in two years. And so when they did their 11,000 person layoff, they reset to, I think, something like March of last year. You know, Google went from 110,000 to 190,000 people over two years. They added 80,000 people. And even at 110,000 people, many people perceive the companies maybe having, you know, some extra overhead. And so... Um, these companies are hitting these massive scales and the type of person that you need or the number of people you need is so large that you have to change the mix of people that you're hiring, right? Because you can't find that many people elsewhere. And so, um, and you still end up with some very smart, very good people. It's just a different type of person, a different personality, a different risk profile, a different view on the world and what's important. And also you individually are no longer moving equity value. And so what you care about is cash and that really changes your incentives and how you think about it, right? So there's all these shifts that happen um, as you're hiring at that scale. And if you think about it, if you add 90,000 people at Google, that's equivalent to adding, I don't know the exact size of Stripe right now, but that would be what, um, probably 20 stripes or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's something. like, it's a yeah. lot, you know, Yeah, it's a lot of people. Or if you think about it as a series C company with a hundred people, you know, uh, you've effectively brought on a thousand series C companies equivalents yep. of people, right? Yep. That's a lot of people. Yep. And, and so do you think this is now shifting uh, back, at least in terms of maybe not the coverage, because it does seem like there's there's this um, cynicism outside in from a media perspective that rightly or wrongly is going to stay just because of the power dynamics mm-hmm. and the size of these companies and the wealth that exists. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's going away. But in terms of the people that are 
the builders, quote unquote, mm-hmm. within the valley, whatever the valley sure. means today. Do you, do you think this uh, pullback is going to be good for that in some ways? Or do you think it yeah. remains to be seen? I think it's net good, but I think these things overlap because ultimately I think the big tech companies are effectively a sink because they're such a large part of the ecosystem from a sheer number perspective, scale, capitalization, sure. and everything else that they govern a lot of the behavior in tech in general because they set how compensation is, they set entitlement, they set culture, they set a bunch of things that then spills over as these people join other companies. And so I almost feel like there's two Silicon Valleys that exist in parallel now. There's the big tech Silicon Valley and there's the the startup Silicon Valley. In the startup Silicon Valley, um, there obviously is like this big reset happening right now. And, um, you know, fundamentally, I think we had a period of overbuilding for two years for most companies because capital is very abundant, metrics shifted in terms of what people cared about. And now we're kind of resetting back to historical norms. And so I think the next six to 18 months are, are you know, going to be pretty turbulent months in terms of layoffs, in terms of companies not being able to raise money and going under just in terms of M&A. Like there's a, there's a really big shift coming that will probably start mid this year through, you know, probably something like mid 2024. I think we're talking about Silicon Valley as a maybe ethos that that includes whatever up to Seattle uh, for for the big tech companies mm-hmm. as well, uh, Amazon and, and Microsoft as the case may be. What do you think about Silicon Valley, the actual geographic land mass that we're sitting in currently? Are you optimistic about the Bay Area and and the sure yeah I'm not, I'm not optimistic about the Bay Area from a company formation perspective. I think the two best places to start a company now in the US are basically the Bay Area and then to a secondary degree, New York. And then it falls out pretty steeply unless you're doing something like aerospace and then it's like LA and Orange County, right? Um, And so it kind of depends on what you're doing as well. But yeah, fundamentally the Bay Area and and New York are now really the two startup ecosystems with the Bay Area being quite a bit bigger um, in terms of both, you know, big, uh, you know, uh, big late stage tech companies as well as a lot of startups. And then New York obviously is increasingly thriving as an ecosystem in parallel. Um, so I think those are the two best places to go if you're going to start something. And is that due to the, uh, the just the talent density that remains in the uh, Bay Area as it currently stands, and then also New York and the rising talent market that's that's there as well? I mean, because you hear a lot of the rhetoric around the politics of San Francisco locally, the politics of California and yeah. taxes and all this stuff. And do you just think the talent density kind of trumps all? Uh, I think right now you have a very strong network effect and network effects tend to be resilient um, to bad external shocks until until everything flips. And then yep. the network effects are very resilient until they're not and then they unravel very fast. They haven't quite unraveled yet despite the best efforts of the city and state. Um, and it's kind of interesting because effectively what California has is the equivalent of oil wealth, right? So you know how like in Norway, they set up an oil fund and they put away, they put aside money for a rainy day because so much money is generated by oil. Yep. And there's this curse of um, having too many natural resources, right? In general, countries that have a lot of natural resources or states end up failing because they just take the money and distribute it to their cohort or friends to keep themselves in power so that they can keep controlling this natural resource. Yep. Tech is sort of like that in California. Hmm. Right. Fundamentally, it's a gusher of tax revenue. Yep. And um, the state and the city ended up with massive surpluses. And um, unfortunately, those surpluses have been used in ways that haven't necessarily translated into building out long term infrastructure or in terms of, you know, the California excess could have been used for desalinization. It could have been used for collecting the enormous amount of rain that's been falling if we're constantly in drought. You yep. know, we don't have modern collection facilities. Um, it can be used in all sorts of ways. Um, instead of being rebated out to the population. And so um, there's that lack of investment in the future that things like Norway are doing, right? And so that is a long-term issue. But the network effect of California and the talent... The network effect of the Bay Area is high enough that it's going to keep going. Yep. Um, And the question is, does it break ever? And if so, what causes it? But it's definitely degraded. And I think New York benefited from that. Like during COVID, the COVID policies were sufficient to drive a pretty big cohort of founders over to New York from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I do think policy matters, and we saw some inkling of that. If COVID policies had continued for another year or two, I think it would have broken the network effect. New York certainly benefited. I, I'm appreciative of, of yeah. that. But um, now, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the venture landscape, you sit in this unique position that you're um, I, you're you're a participant in the ecosystem, but also unique in that I don't know if there's other too many other angel investors that are leading uh, big big rounds and all that. What do you think of the, the state of the venture ecosystem today? Because I, 
we we've always said there's too much capital in the in the industry, right? I think it's been said uh, at least. I, I entered the industry. I entered tech in 2012. I entered venture in 2014, and certainly the totality of that time, we've talked about how crazy it is. It does feel like there's a lot of money in the ecosystem right now. What's your what's your perspective on the state of the venture landscape? How much money has been raised? All that. Yeah, it's kind of funny because if you actually go back and read articles from the 80s. There's quotes from venture capitalists saying there's too much money in the ecosystem. I was talking to someone, I think Seven Rosen actually like shut down in whatever, 2003, 2004, Mm -hmm. when, you know, historic venture firm, because they were like, there's no money to be made in this asset class anymore. It's way too much. It's all dried out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's been like the perennial complaint from venture capitalists. Yeah. As a founder, you're like, great, you know, there's more people to fund me and maybe it gives me more shots on goal with my business or maybe it allows me to keep going. Um, so I guess it depends on who it's bad for. You know, yeah. More money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the reality is that money is coming out of the system for three reasons. Number one is um, a lot of a traditional capital, hedge funds, family offices, et cetera, have at least temporarily exited uh, big chunks of venture as opportunities in public markets have gotten dramatically better. Um, and that money may come back in two, three years as things readjust. But again, we're going to have a two year sort of rough period, I think, to, to get there. Um, secondly, um, the people who give money to uh, venture capitalists, who are known as limited partners or LPs, um, they're all uh, reallocating relative to venture right now. And so that's shifting the amount of capital that's going in. Or I should say, it seems like that community is basically doubling down on a subset of people they work with that they think will sustain over time and they're pulling capital from others. Yes. And, and the denominator effect that they're feeling, right? Because mm-hmm. the public markets are down or whatever it is. Yeah. And so their venture is over. So they're reallocating. Um, and then in parallel, the venture funds themselves are going from what was a historically fast cycle of investing. So during COVID, each venture capital fund would get spent in a year. Before COVID, it'd take two, three years. And we're going back to two, three years. So even if a venture fund raises the same dollar amount, if it's spread over two, three years instead of one year, then you have a half or a third as much money per year. Yep. And so I think one of the things that people are missing is, oh, great, the headline number is the same. But you know what? If it's over three years, it's really a third as much money. Yep. Um, so money is coming out of the system through those three mechanisms. And I think if you look at the um, almost like dominoes, um, the stuff happens in the founder community that impacts the venture capitalists six months, a year, two years later, as they sort of remark their holdings. And then a year or two later, it impacts the LP community, and then it cascades. And so I think it's going to take some time for all that to kind of work through. You know, we're, we're certainly seeing all elements of that today. The, the other side of that is the opportunity set that exists from an investment standpoint. Are there, are there areas uh, we talked about or touched on crypto going into a winter? Now, it seems like a lot of, uh, a lot of people are excited about generative AI and some of the stuff OpenAI is doing. And, you know, We've we've had Ahmad uh, Mastak from Stability on, and um, are are there areas you, you started a prominent company in in health tech, biotech? What, what would you, how would you characterize? Yeah, that's like color? digital health, digital or, health, you know, health software. Yeah. yeah, and so so you've touched on some of these innovative areas. Um, are there things you're particularly excited about today? Yeah, there's probably like um, three or four different areas. I think one big area to your point is like generative AI, and I think this is you know this shift in underlying models, either diffusion based or transformer based, are going to be transformative on multiple levels for multiple types of companies. So I think that's the biggest trend for the next five or 10 years in terms of that that big transformational wave. And is there something that you um, you see in particular, like the types of use cases that if you're explaining it to your to your mom or your aunt or the random person in the grocery store line, like are, are there things that get you really excited about the possibility? Because when sure. I when I talk to people about it, it, it often can feel abstract or uh, it yeah. can feel like very media centric, right? In, in certain aspects, yeah, like, ChatGPT has democratized it in a way that yeah, I think people now internalize a lot more. But yeah, the synthesis I think of ChatGPT is striking. Um, the example I used to use, um, you know, because I, you know, I, I worked on AI for a long time. Yeah. Right? I, I worked on it at Google on the ads targeting side. The search team at Twitter worked for me for a while, um, and then I invested for like a decade in AI companies, and roughly nothing worked, right? Yeah. For a decade. <laughs> Um, it worked for incumbents, uh, all the CNN and RNN and like early GAN stuff, yeah. but it didn't really work for um, startups. And then now I think we have a way where it's actually working for startups. You know, the examples I give are things like, you know, you show up to your email and every reply is auto written already and you just have to click send or edit it slightly, right? Yep. Or um, you're a salesperson, it'll, it'll se- send out all the sales emails uh, to try and convince customers to do something or to follow up with them or, to, you know, so... Um, it's basically creating and generating content on your behalf in ways that could be done in your own voice, or it can synthesize and give you information that's really valuable, or it can do all sorts of other things, right? And so I think there's examples like that that have tended to resonate with people that I talk to. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so I think that's like one really big segment that um, a lot of my time has gone into over the last maybe like 18 ish months, yep. something like that. Makes sense. Um, a second area is just ongoing like SaaS and SaaS innovation. A third is sort of next generation data stack. So I think Wait, on, the, on the SaaS yeah. side particularly, are there one of the things, because I've been an enterprise software SaaS investor for the totality of my career, and um, there, there's, uh, I think, businesses like Trip, Act, Trip Actions that you're, you've invested in. Like there's people that are innovating on legacy processes still, right? And going out concur in some ways and they're you know whatever their b2b travel business and um, i'm an investor in ramp and they're doing you know similar different stuff as well um are, are there because in some ways i keep hearing hey there's new vertical markets that people are investing in but but when you start to break down the vertical markets of SaaS that people are investing in now it's getting smaller and smaller it's getting right? more, and more niche i think um the large language model foundation model like um AI based approaches are actually radically important. Yeah, it's interesting. For anything that's very people heavy in an existing enterprise or SaaS process. And so a great example is um, uh, you know, the support queue and travel should actually be covered by an AI, right? Or the uh, ops team for a large sort of human manually driven business should be transformed through the use of these types of models. It kind of reminds me in some ways of what um, mobile did within B2B in the 2012 to 2016, 18 range where there for, for, for B2B within large language models that there were, there were some companies that fundamentally shifted the paradigm and built really important companies, but there were also new attack vectors or enablement processes that needed to be figured out within B2B. Uh, is that sort of your perspective as well? That it'll be some combination of both, but maybe it leans a little bit more to enabling some incumbents in different ways. Yeah. I mean, in general, um, one of the things, um, I've read about before is the degree to which each technology wave has some subset of value that's captured by incumbents and some that's captured by startups. So for example, the first internet wave was like 80% startups. And then um, crypto is 100% startups. Mobile was probably 80% incumbents and 20% startups. So startups like Uber and Instagram and others captured a lot of the outcome of mobile. But in, um, you know, CRM, mobile CRM was Salesforce on your phone. It wasn't yeah, sure. any product, right? Yep. And so similarly, I think with the um, foundation model or language model world, it's going to be similar where probably 80% of the value gets captured by incumbents. And it was 100% for the first AI wave, in my opinion, right? Or the prior one. But 20% will go to startups. And it'll be startups who are either building new, interesting, disruptive products in. It may be some of the platform companies like an open AI. Um, it may be consumer-centric things like character. You know, So there's a variety of different things that I think that are kind of happening right now that are super interesting. And there will be that differential value. Um, one of the things I thought would be really interesting to do is to go through some private equity software portfolios and just ask, where do you have things where it's very people intensive or ops intensive or customer support intensive? And can you use these language models to basically drop 80% of your cost structure, right? And so you could either do that as a buyout and yeah. you know be a better bidder. Like if you're Tomo Bravo, I'd be like, sure, yeah, you know, yeah. Using Vista this and Tomo model. Bravo, they're updating their playbooks. Yeah, yeah, say, that's what right? I'd be doing, yeah. right? Um, or you know, can you build the disruptor coming in as a brand new software company where you've radically changed the cost structure or the speed of the business, right? It's interesting. So, so, so you said SaaS data was the, the yeah next data one? infrastructure. So next gen data stack. So that'd be you know the Snowflake, Databricks, sure. DBT, Fivetran, Airbyte kind of world. Um, then I think there's there's um, these sort of N of one index companies that are really interesting per market, but I don't think there's very many interesting companies in a market. So like for defense tech, I think that's Anduril, right? I think there's basically two companies to build in defense tech and Anduril is one of them, hmm. right? Um, and for other markets, you could ask, what is the thing that effectively provides me an index on this market segment, right? So for um, AI and large language models, maybe that's open AI right now, and maybe that evolves into an oligopoly market with multiple players. But, um, you know, they're the, they're the trip actions is kind of it for corporate travel, in my yeah. opinion, right? They've kind of really pulled ahead of the pack. And I think they're the most interesting, like next gen company in that area. And so it's almost asking, like, what are the companies that give you the market segment? Um, Stripe was that when it launched, right? It was basically indexing e commerce. Coinbase was that for crypto for a while, because mm -hmm. if everything gets traded on Coinbase and you're taking a cut of every transaction, you you effectively have an index fund, right? On top of crypto. And so I think there's this concept of like, what are the index companies for each wave or each shift? And some of that could be vertical specific and some of that could be horizontal. And do you think of that from a top down, uh, how much of that surfaced bottom up that, like you mentioned the defense tech example in Andrew, uh, had you been working on that thesis uh, that this was going to happen and then 
that that crossed your desk? Uh, for Anduril in particular, I thought there was going to be some interesting defense tech company. Um, and when I ran across Anduril, I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is probably it, right? But I remember um, there was that uh, kerfuffle, kerfuffle or kerfuffle? Kerfuffle. There was that kerfuffle at Google where yeah. um, a bunch of people got upset about Project Maven. Yes. And they shut down Maven at Google. And I actually remember calling um, one of the directors of Eng there and saying, hey, did a bunch of people quit over Maven because I'd love to see if they want to do like a defense tech company, right? Because I was like, okay, if, if a lot of the big tech companies aren't participating, there's room. And it turned out that a lot of the people who quit were people who were against Maven. The people who were for it all stayed at Google. <laughs> and so there wasn't an opportunity. Um, but I, would, I was already kind of digging in because it felt like there's a why now statement in terms of incumbents not participating. And if you look at defense tech over time, usually the incumbent um, tech companies were, were, were always working with the DoD. And that was a first moment in time where there, there were, where there was a shift against it. And so I thought that created a startup opportunity. Then obviously there was the technology shifts of machine vision, AI, and drones. And so there was like two or three why now stacked on top of each other. So you're like, there's an opportunity. Yeah. No, interesting. Are, are there other things? Uh, I, I, I heard you nuclear and energy, maybe some stuff within biotech. Are there other areas that you're kind of thinking about? Oh, um, there's stuff I think is super interesting. I just think that they're, they're kind of hard. Like I think uh, nuclear is obviously a very rational thing to do, just yep. even fission. Uh, uh, but you know, there's sort of regulatory reasons. Yes, that there's a lot of tectonic happening. pieces that need to be yeah. shifted. But it's kind of crazy. If you actually look at the Wikipedia page for, um, nuclear accidents and incidents over all time, uh, the total number of deaths is very small. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, um, I think it's something like more people die falling off of roof rooftops, installing solar every year than die from anything nuclear related. Yeah. Right. And so the perception of the industry is very different from the reality, but that's prevented, really cheap, abundant power from being available. And that is an input into everything that society does. Mm. And so I think one big societal question is how do you create more abundance, particularly energy abundance? And um, you know, maybe it's a two-sided coin where you say, okay, we'll use any type of energy for the right purpose and the right application in the right time, and we'll do solar and we'll do wind and we'll do nuclear and we'll do oil and gas. And you know, um, at the same time, we'll also invest in technologies that extract carbon from the air. So we have that balance in terms of what we're doing but there's technology solutions to both, right? And then if you have enormous energy abundance and extremely cheap energy, um, everything in society gets cheaper. It's a massive deflationary force. And there's all sorts of things you can suddenly do, right? It's a fundamental piece of how our, how our economy works and how our society works. But instead, we're choosing to constrain and regulate and, you know... Um, if you could wave your hands, how would you actually... Is there a path? I haven't thought too deeply yeah, about this. I mean, this. France is 70% nuclear power. We know that it works and we know that you can do it in a safe way at large scale in a modern country. Yeah. So it's not, again, it's, it's happening. It's just, we've chosen not to do it here despite the data that it's fine, right? France is doing perfectly well yeah. with most of their um, energy being produced that way. What about b the biotech industry, the, the good and the bad within biotech? And yeah. yeah, I don't do very much biotech at this point. I think um, for a variety of structural reasons, it's kind of a tougher place to really have an impact. Um, and the founding models are different and the you know, the purpose of the companies is different and it tends to be hired gun CEOs instead of founders running the company. So it's just a very different kind of, it's a lot of science risk and I tend not to do a lot of science risk things. So I think that's kind of a tough area. Um, I do think there's interesting things to do in climate um, just because it's such a, a giant sort of pseudo regulatory tailwind. Um, so I, I just think there's like three or four areas like that. The only other thing I had was, uh, was Twitter, but I think we can skip that unless you have anything you want to, the, the current what's going on with Twitter. Yeah, I mean, basically everything that Twitter's building now, we knew should have been built 12 years I, I ago. I have to imagine, I mean, having worked there, uh, all these ideas have been thought of and battle tested in some way, shape, yeah, or form. Yeah, no, there, th there was like five different mocks for how do you do editable tweets. Yeah. Right, it's not, it's, you can do it all sorts of ways from UI perspective. There just never was the decision to launch, right? I guess it's interesting from a decisioning standpoint because because Twitter, in some ways, there were the technological challenges behind it, right? Like the it, it was a monolithic application. I think for a long time, you needed to carve off pieces of of that to make it microservice based, so you could actually whatever ship co ship things quickly. But um, a lot of these other things were uh, were ch more. Uh, preference maybe or, or uh stylistic considerations or societal considerations like how were the decisions actually made about some of these large sweeping things it was one of those places where there was um where it was often tough to make decisions in the early days i think the decisions were tough to make because the infrastructure kept falling over and so it's hard to say let's go launch these five new features when anytime you launch a feature it breaks the whole site yeah. right and so 
to your point, you had to take a step back and fix that first. And when my company got acquired by Twitter, the first thing my engineering team went and did, because originally we were going to build in geolocation and other features, um, geotagging, all sorts of yeah, stuff. Sure. Um, we ended up going and fixing the deploy queue because the company hadn't been able to deploy code for three weeks, wow. right? And so you literally couldn't ship because everything was broken. And so we went and fixed that as our first task as an acquired company that was supposed to be doing other things. Um, and so that created a little bit of fear in the culture about pushing things because everything would break every time you'd push because of a monolithic code base. Yep. And eventually that got cleaned up. But I think it set a little bit of the culture. Um, and then I just think like there, there was this... Um, you know, it, it started off not as a very data-driven culture. And so decisions at that time were made more arbitrarily or emotionally and that impacted things. So I just think like there was a, there was a few different things that all kind of piled up together. Yeah. And, and there was a bunch of different people, uh, opinionated people in the beginning that all had different power dynamics, right? Some of the chaos sure. of the early days seemed to continue to manifest in, in other ways. And it sort of felt like, um, I don't know, the company never exactly was consistent about what it wanted to be when it grew up like was it going to be mm -hmm. a, a communication protocol was it going to be a, a media platform i think the challenge for twitter in part was um you know how there's kind of like the child star that grows up and it's yes. always in the limelight totally. and they end up having a really rough life because everything they do is like blown up in the press things come easy early on and you know yeah and twitter was kind of like that where a lot of the things that happened to twitter happened to every other company that i've seen go through hyper growth like you turn over the executive team a few times, right? Facebook did that, Google did that. Every company does that because the people early on are different from the people in the middle, they're different from a little bit later. And so you, that's natural. But the media at the time covered it as like this really big deal of chaos. Because they were all on it. They're all on it, yeah. It was, it was a child star that grew up in the limelight and didn't have a chance, right? Mm, yeah. And so I feel like there were some dynamics like that too. What about, uh, it just seems like you, you think in uh, very structured uh kind of concise like you you have uh interesting insights about about a bunch of different topics and all all this how do you actually spend your day and how do you internalize all these different things you've obviously written a book that was a synthesis of a bunch of people's insights and all of that how do you go about retaining all of these things i was just yeah i just read a lot and um you know i talk to a lot of people that i think just are really smart and so i think those sorts of things build on themselves because a few talk to smart people, you have certain insights, and then you talk to more smart people and it just kind of keeps going. And so I think there's like a feedback loop of like, um, you know, finding other like minded people who just like read a lot and like to think about a variety of topics. And so it's just kind of fun to talk about this stuff. You know? If you were a young enterprising person that I don't know, it was either a startup founder or a uh, investor today and wanted to future proof themselves for the next whatever 30 years, uh, is there anything that you're um, particularly proud that that you did or any habits that you formed or is it just this consistently learning and, and the evolving back to the early the, yeah. the first thing we talked about which is willingness to you know continue to iterate yeah i think it depends on the type of person and what drives them right and i think um there's almost two modalities for long-term success there's probably more but two that come to mind immediately uh one is that quest for knowledge relevant to technology and innovation right and that keeps you current and interested and in cycles and everything else the second is organization building so if you're somebody who really wants to build out an organization, it can effectively become a de, a de facto platform by which you maintain relevance and stay in sort of the middle of these things. And so that's starting an important company um, or that's, uh, you know, starting a venture firm if that's what yeah, and sure. so, or joining one and then yeah. being part of that institution. And so the institutions matter or that personal driver matters. And in the absence of those things, I think it's probably harder to stay current because you don't really have an anchor. And so the question is, what is your anchor relative to what you do and what you love? And how do you maintain that relationship to that thing? And it doesn't go stale because once it goes stale and you break the anchor, you're just going to float away. Yeah. No, oh, it's, it's interesting. It's a, uh, it's something that I get asked all the time of career advice or, uh, how do you, what's your answer? It? I don't have a great one. Um, I feel like the path that I followed, uh, was not one that I would necessarily recommend for anyone, or at least those doors have closed. Like I, I started my career in investment banking and then found my way into, uh, you know, software as an industry. And then I got a job as a junior person and just sort of rode my way through, but I was a liberal arts major that just sort of, uh, kept falling forward or kept as doors closed behind me, I sort of walked through them. And so I'm not sure other than a willingness to um, continue to put myself out there and send the cold email or uh, start the podcast or whatever it is, like a willingness to a bias to action, I guess, and just like keep trying uh, things. I think that's all 
I, I have, but it's also a ton of, I mean, I'm totally conscious of all the luck associated with it, right? Like I, it was, I don't think you could ever recreate the path that I took just because it was right place, right time, right opportunity. And so on. Yeah, you, you may be understating it because I think um, there's a good Woody Allenism, which is 90% of success is showing up. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't show up or they, you know, it's the old shoot your shot, you know, people just aren't shooting their shot. Totally. And then I think the other 10% is follow up or follow through. Interesting. And so I think like a lot of success is just like you go to a bunch of stuff until something works or is interesting. Yeah. And then you actually follow up and do what you say you're going to do or uh, follow through on something you promise or, you know, just keep at it. Right. Yeah. And so I think um, I think that's very underrated and it's really crucial. And that's part of these founder traits around um, that drive that I mentioned. Right. It's like you have this focus to keep doing certain things and following up on them and going to them and doing them. You know, you, you need that momentum and it's not the pursuit i guess the one other insight that I, I would have and i think this is very true for you but uh there was no elot gill when you set out to go do this right and you you just picked the path that found it found, you found interesting and that was natural and that you enjoyed and all of that and i, I think if i had picked the path that seemed interesting or cool uh, to everyone else, right? That was the hype. To, I would have gone into private equity in 2011 or 12. I would have gone to work at, you know, Toma Brava or Vista or one of those things. And I was like, well, that's not quite for me. And it seems like if you're chasing what's hot, uh, you know, if you tried to enter something a, a year ago, you would have gone into crypto. Today, it's going to be generative AI. Three years ago, it might have been whatever, uh, scooters or bots or whatever, whatever the things are, right? It's a moving target. And so you kind of need to figure out what you're yeah. uniquely passionate about. Yeah, I think that's true. I do think there are some universal truths, though, in terms of um, how to have a great career. And one of them is a show up and the second one is follow up. But I think the other piece of it is if I were to choose a major to study, it'd be computer science or something that allows me to build. Yep. So if I need to, I can build stuff yep. and I'm, I'm fluent in the language of things. Um, two is if I were to join a company, I'd join a breakout company that's clearly working. Right. And so joining a company that's working is dramatically better than going to a startup that may or may not work yep. early in your career. Is there, is um, there a, uh, is there a stage in particular that you would look to, or is yeah, it just, if you could join something that's between say, it depends on how big it gets, right? Like Google went from. 1500 to 200,000 or whatever, most companies never make it there, right? Yeah. But um, I think somewhere between, you know, 20, 30 people up to like a thousand to a few thousand, depending on the final prospects of the company. If you're at 2000, but it can go to 20,000, great. Um, but if not, if it's 2000, it's going to go to 3000, it's less of a good place to join. But you kind of want to join during those high growth periods because you have, you meet a lot of the early people, you have trust of the founders or executives, you get a lot of opportunities you wouldn't otherwise because things are growing really fast. So growth and momentum matters. Yes. The industry segment matters. And so um, one piece of advice that somebody gave me before was um, you want to choose the most interesting company in the most interesting segment in the segment that you think will last for a while because then you'll be in the middle of everything good, yeah. right? And it doesn't matter what your role is. and It doesn't matter what you do. Just go and join that company. And if you can't get into that company, join something else in the same segment and then maybe you can join that company later. It's like going to Yahoo and then joining Google back in the day or yeah. whatever. Um, and the pursuit of, uh, I mean, one of the things I do see people fall on is getting wrapped around the titles. Who was mm -hmm. it that said, get on the rocket ship and don't ask what seat? It's an interesting thing where no one cares if you're the VP of shit co, right? Yeah. Uh, it's much more, it's going to be a stamp on your resume. It's going to be the people you associate with and the network you yeah. build is working at Stripe or totally. Snowflake or whatever it is. Yeah. So right? if I wanted to go into tech, that's what I would do, right? And so I joined the breakout and then I just... Um, you know, adapt to that wave. Yep. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at some of the most prominent founders out of Google, um, you know, I think they had backgrounds that were very different from, you know, the standard CS degree. Like Ben from Pinterest, I think was on the customer ops team or something. Hmm. I think I could be misremembering it. That Kevin Systrom from Instagram was a, a product marketing manager or something, mm. right? Yep. Versus like an engineer. Yep. And so like a lot of the really interesting founders out of one of the most iconic companies who built the most iconic things had the odd background relative to that company, but they joined the interesting company, mm. right? And I think that's a little bit telling. Yeah, interesting. Well, on that note. Yeah, great to- Thank you very much. This is great. I appreciate it. So that'll do it for the 49th episode of The Logan Bartlett Show. Thank you, Eli Gill, for coming on. Uh, thank you to Justin and Rashad for helping produce uh, this. And I really appreciate everyone listening. We have a fun episode next week that uh, we recorded in New York. One of the original uh, folks in venture capital um, that we were able to get on the podcast. And so I think it was a really fun conversation. I trust that you'll, uh, you'll enjoy hearing that one as well. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening in. Hope you have a good weekend.